Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. We've done well over 500 of them now, and uh, if this is new to you, if you haven't seen one before, go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and uh, look under the past interviews menu where you'll find all the previous ones archived in various ways. This program is made possible through the support of appreciative listeners and viewers, so if you appreciate it and would like to help support it, there's a PayPal button on every page of batgap.com. My guest today is Ingrid Honkala, PhD. Welcome, Ingrid. Thanks so much, Rick. Thanks for having me here. It's just such an honor. Ah, well, so it's happy. a delight to have you. And um, I read your whole book this past week uh, entitled A Brightly Guided Life, How a Scientist Learned to Hear Her Inner Wisdom. And uh, it's quite a book. And we'll be talking about a lot of the stuff that you wrote about in that book during this interview. And a few things you didn't write about because I had a few questions as I read it, which um, I still have. Um, but let me, let me just say a few things about you quickly. Um, Ingrid was born in Bogota, Colombia. Um, and she had a near-death experience when she was nearly three years old um, from drowning in a tank of cold water. It's a good thing it was cold, by the way. You know that, don't you? I mean, you don't want to drown in warm water because your brain doesn't mm -hmm. last very long. But cold water, people have lasted up to half an hour and, and been revived and been okay. So anyway, yes. it's 8,600 feet in Bogota, so that's why the water was cold. <laughs> um, Ingrid, now during this experience, and she'll be telling us in detail, she had, um, she became aware of other dimensions of life and began to perceive beings of light. And they have, um, she's been in touch with them on and off throughout her life ever since. And they have helped her in various ways, which we'll also discuss. Um, Ingrid had a whole lot of challenges. Um, Colombia was a country at war as she was growing up there, and she went through all sorts of things, which we'll describe in some detail. Um, but she ended up um, getting a PhD in, would, would you say oceanography, or is it more specific? Yeah, uh, marine, so to be more specific, marine sciences with emphasis in biological oceanography. Okay, marine sciences. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And um, she's worked at NASA. She's um, traveled all over the world. Um, she's done all kinds of interesting things. And um, and her life has also had a profound spiritual track to it as uh, as she developed this professional track. Um, all righty. So there's a lot more to the bio, but let's just um, get into our conversation and details will come out as we go. <clears throat> Let's do that. All right. So it seems like the best place to start is this near-death experience story, which I'm sure you've told a thousand times, but people mm -hmm. listening to this probably haven't heard it. So uh, let's start with that. Yes, Rick, thanks. Yeah, that, like you mentioned, I, I live in Bogota at the time, and um, I live with my parents and two of my sisters at the time, and it was normal those days in Colombia to have a maid living in the house. So my parents would leave for work. They left us at the care of this lady. And when they would go out, she didn't even pay attention to us. So early one morning, my oldest sister, who was close to four, I was close to three, decided, oh, let's go play. And there was a patio at the back of the house. We went to the patio. It was very early, around six in the morning, 6.30. And then uh, in this patio, there was a tank. And the purpose of this tank was for hand washing clothes. Back in the day, we didn't have a washing machine. So this tank was for to collect water. It, it held about 900 gallons of water. And next to the tank, there was a flat surface for scrubbing. So we grabbed a couple of stools. My sister climbed the tank and she sat on the flat surface. So she was a little bit safer compared with me. I went to the other side. It was a thin edge. And being a child, what is the danger? So I'm leaning very precariously in this tank. She grabbed the ball and she thought, oh, yeah, the idea was to play cash across the tank. So she grabbed a ball, she tossed or she threw the ball at me and at that moment, she didn't apply enough force. 
and the ball fell on the water. And, oh, I thought I could grab it. What is the problem? I leaned forward to try to grab the ball and it rolled on the surface of the water. And then I fell into the tank. Like you mentioned, the, the, probably the temperature in this tank was about 30, 40 degrees Fahrenheit. The water was frigid cold. So that was the first thing, was the, the feeling of like, <gasps> this water is cold. And then after that was that sense rake of like, uh, why I cannot breathe. I have never been in a pool. We didn't have a bathtub. So I did not have an idea that if you fall in the water, you, you, you drown. I didn't know this. So I'm now in this state of absolute horror why I cannot breathe. And then I just sunk into the tank. And when I am in this desperate attempt to just try to get out of this water, didn't know how to swim, I went in just like that from this state of complete terror to just like, oh, one of absolute peace. I didn't have to fight anymore. I didn't need to breathe. I didn't need to escape from this tank. It was like, wow. I didn't have idea what was happening, but I was feeling incredibly well. And then I always like to put like describe some little contrast that happened there because one thing is this tank was entirely made of cement. It had a roof. So the area in the tank was very dark. So the last thing I saw with my eyes open was like the darkness of the space. And then in just like a flash, a light came from below. And this light was like the light of a candle, but it was able to illuminate the whole water surrounding. And now I'm like, wow, there's light. The next thing, the next incredible contrast was that I live in a house that was very noisy. We have dogs, birds, cousins, my sister. So there was always noise. And the last thing I also heard before I went to the state of peace was my heart. Imagine the scare. My heart was pounding in my chest, like the anxiety. I could hear it in my head. Boom, boom, boom. And it went silent. There was the state of, I just experienced absolute silence. And it's what I, what I call the silence behind the silence. Because never in my life after that I could experience that. And I wanted that silence, Rick. Later I will hide in closets, chapels, whatever it was to find that silence. So that was the other thing. And this moment I am mesmerized by, oh, this feels so good. And then I started to see bubbles suspended in the water. And these bubbles were surrounded by light. And it was by looking these bubbles, like, wow, and chasing the bubbles that I turn around. And then I saw a body suspended in the water. And it's when incredibly, I just, at that moment, had the realization, the clarity, like, oh, that's my body. I didn't even feel afraid. And Rick, it was the sense like, oh, this already had happened. I was familiar with this situation, like, oh, I already like I already had changed bodies many times. I experienced like the eternity of, of who I was. Now, let me interrupt you right here. This is interesting. So you were not even three years old and you're you're describing this now with your adult mind. Um, but you're describing things that uh, a two or three year old could hardly conceive of. Well, it's particularly this last thing you said that you had the realization that you have changed bodies many times. So you're allu alluding to reincarnation. So there's two interesting things here. One is that you would be able to entertain such a concept as re reincarnation. And the other is that um, what that struck me throughout that strikes me throughout this whole story is that you remember it so vividly as if it happened yesterday, even though it happened maybe almost, you know, 40 something years ago. So what do you say to those things? You know, Rick, that's incredible because that's the clarity I have about this experience. And to the point that even when I mentioned it and I wrote it on the book, even when we saw the, the balls in the patio, I can even have memory of the color of the ball and the, the, 
it had like high relief uh, letters embossed, on it. I, they call it embossed, yeah. Oh, embossed. And I could even remember the drawings that were next to each letter. It's like how clear this is in my mind. Yeah. And, and when I had that, that clarity of like even seeing like, wow, this already happened. It was the sense of I am familiar with this and I cannot explain how I knew this. Yeah, but, but you I did. knew. And, and even when we talk about the after effects, when I came back, I already came back with clarity. I didn't come back like a child that had a near dead and you came back like a, like a wise no, person I, I all of a sudden. We now, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, how I knew these things, I, I couldn't explain. But even even again, like later in, in the experience, when, when I joined or when I was in this realm of the life was, again, the sense of familiarity. I already have been here. I already have experience here. I'm just coming back home. So, yeah, this whole experience. And, and again, that's why I also like to bring all the points of contrast, because I think that's what also make this experience so beautiful or I guess impossible to forget. Because there were so many things that I, I experienced that brought that extreme contrast. And the other one that I am about to mention is when I saw the body, Rick, and I was born as a very sick child. And I spent the, almost the first three years of my life feeling unwell. So up to this point of my life, I didn't even know how to feel well meant for, for Ingrid as, as a three-year-old. And now I am in experiencing the sense of absolute well-being. Like I'm feeling so well that, wow, look at the decisions. Look at the clarity, how I could even make this decision with, with, so, with the knowing that I could make it. I just look at the body and I'm like, I'm not going back there. <laughs> yeah. And I just look at the body and I'm like, why I want to be in that body. And I feel so well that this is the other part that I said, sometimes we will ask why a child will be born sick, why these things could happen. And for me, in, in my own experience, I cannot talk for other people, but that brought me at that moment that, or, or the memory of holding that point of contrast. What was to feel unwell and what was to feel so well. It's interesting that a person can feel well when they don't even have a body. It it makes you wonder, like, what do we, f what is it that we feel, or, or you know, what are we feeling with if we don't have a body? <laughs> yeah, and you know what, I have thought about that, Rick. Like, and and even when I look people that are very sick with sickness, cancer, whatever it is, and you go to sleep, how is it possible that you can even rest if your body's in so much pain, but you go to sleep and you disconnect? Mm -hmm. And this is, this, I would just, to put that analogy, that's how it feels. It's like you, it's like pretty much at that moment, your body or, or the concept or whatever it is, your body separates and, and you don't feel, you don't have. Later, actually, when I came back, Rick, I would have that question for years. I said, how could I have seen my body lifeless if I was still alive? Mm -hmm. yeah. More alive than ever. How is it possible? Well, you not only saw your body in the tank, but as I'm sure you're about to tell us, you saw, you went, traveled around a little bit and saw other people. I, I, <laughs> I did, which was made this amazing because, and it's what validates also the whole experience even more because at that moment, like I said, I just saw the body. I'm not going back there. Turn around. <laughs> and I started to see flowers that were blooming from nowhere. And this is this is amazing because now you think about this something I think now I didn't think it back there but I'm like what happened with dimension how big these flowers were that I was picked up by flowers see so these are things I think now of course by then I just was picked up by flowers and it was this is great even the flowers were picking you up they, you were sitting on them yes yes okay so and who was being picked up I don't know see I if I think about it now I can create the ideas, but at the time I just didn't. I, I'm just like now being carried by flowers. I just said, wow, this feels so good. And I put the analogy like it's going back to the womb. 
because again it was that sense of like oh, I don't have to do anything <laughs> I'm just being carried and then I am just there in just a, the state of uh, just feeling so happy joyful good and then in just a flash like that I appear in the maid's room and I'm like floating above her bed and I'm looking at her and this is again look at look at how incredible are these memories Rick that I can even remember the soap opera she was listening in the radio and she was completely unaware that I was there and I'm like oh that's Maria nothing so from there in again just a flash I appear in my mom's way my mom was walking at the time she didn't have a car <clears throat> and she had to walk to her bus stop and it was a big neighborhood and I appear there <laughs> and again I, I am floating like above her and the moment Rick I, she was actually walking she couldn't there's more a story behind but she just got this new job so imagine the decision she had to make at this moment if she doesn't want to be late for that job or anything she would not have turn around but at that moment when I said oh that's mom she stopped she did not hesitate she just stopped and it's, she knew she knew something was happening at home yeah and she turned around and started to run back home how far was she from the home it was far, Rick. It was about 10 minutes walking. Wow. So, so five, five long, minutes running, maybe. Yeah, so we don't know how long I was under the water yeah. in reality. But yeah, maybe about five minutes. And she started to run. And I just looked at her and I'm like, oh. And at that moment, it's like I raised my, I, I, I say my head because I didn't have the concept that I wasn't, I raised my vision and I saw a dog and I love animals. So it was like at the end of a street. And in just like that, I was with the dog. I'm like, whoa. So at that moment, I turned my head and I look at a tree. And now I am with the tree. And I'm like, whoa. So I just started to play this game of going places. Did the dog sense your presence? I don't know. Uh -huh. I, I don't Sometimes remember. animals do see yeah. subtle things, you know? They, they do. They do. But no, at that moment, I was just, it was so fast, Rick. It was like. I turned my head, saw a tree, and now I'm with the tree. So I'm like, oh, I just started to play this game of going places. Like, this is super fun. <laughs> <laughs> and then from there, everything in these experiences would happen in like, in, in a second, like in a flash. Now, just like that, I appear in a realm. And it was made of pure, intense, shiny light. I was like, whoa. And it was the first time, Rick, in those almost three years of my life that I have the sense, the feeling that oh, I am home. I have to also tell you something. Why did I feel this feeling of home? One, I was burning at my, like I mentioned to you, my body was always unwell. Two, my parents were forced to marry, so it's not really a, a very good situation happening at home. They will leave us the mate, who is a very abusive person. So the situation at home was very hard. And now I am in this realm of the light where everything feels well, where, felt well, where I felt welcome, where I am home. And I... I put the analogy, for me, it was the sense of like, say in the morning I went to school or I left home or I went somewhere and I am back. But it's not like even three years had passed. It was the sense, of, wow, I am back home. Like, this just happened. So again, that sense of familiarity kept repeating. And, and if you ask me, yeah, I don't know how I knew all these things, but it was that clear. And then now... Was there anything in that light that you could perceive or was it just sort of light? It was only light, but that was feeling. That uh -huh. was the sense that I was not alone. Right. So it was the sense like, I, I again, I can I work with analogies, the sense that you get home and you know your parents, your family, your wife is somewhere in the house. Yeah. But, and so I, I felt welcome. That was the right. feeling. I am being welcome. And then at that moment, although I saw the body in the water and I knew I was my body, I did not have that realization that 
I am not that. So look at how far this went, Rick, because he went to knowing at that moment, I am not that. So I look at myself and I realize myself as a being of light. I am a being of light. And then I started to have that sense of like, just this this sense of well-being amplified like 10 times. So it was the sense of like, wow, I'm part of all this. I, I, there was no sense of, again, I am that body, I am this, I am that. And then I felt that sense even today, I could just say with all the, the learnings, all the teachings I, I experienced, and I experienced it many times throughout my life, the sense of nothingness. What I mean with this, there was no presence of sound, of color, of meaning, of concept, of nothing I knew, body, nothing. I, I, there was nothing, Rick. <laughs> it's like pure consciousness all by itself. Yes, Yeah. pure consciousness. And I am in this nothingness state. When some people get very scared when I say nothing. <laughs> but I, f- I feel or now I, I know with all the other experiences that at, at the same time is the state of wholeness. Because it's just pure expansion. You feel is what we call bliss, I guess. And then at that moment, my mom arrived home, and this is the other incredible thing, Rick. She knew exactly where to go. And she, we li- we lived in a ha- big house, and she directed herself to the back of the house. This is the other thing I said about my mom. She was a very, very intuitive woman. And I said to people, but it's not just the intuition; it's that you learn to hear your own intuition yeah and i was always like that and she told you later that she could see auras and things like that too and, yes yeah. and, and spirits and all that so right. she since she was very little she was very sensitive she always was all her life so and um, she went to the patio and this is a question that people ask me my sister was still there and people ask me why your sister didn't go talk to the maid what happened, Rick, was that this lady was very abusive. Mm. She, she, and we were afraid of her. So look what kids do: fear of reprisal. She, she didn't go. She's afraid she'd get in trouble or something. Exactly, and she was just trying to get me out of the water. But she was too little, and the tank was deep. So my mom got there. She, my sister said Ingrid is there, and I cannot get her. My mom worked with children. She had. Some training, my mom always wanted to be a doctor in reality. She read a lot. Any training that was out there available, she will take it. She had some training somehow to do some CPR. I don't even know how that training was at the time, but she went into the water. She got me out and she started to do anything she knew to revive me. And at that moment, Rick, I was so disconnected from this reality. I did not feel anything. There was nothing to do with this body, with this physical reality. But again, like everything in this experience, I felt like that in a blast that I had jumped from the tallest building in the world. And there was nothing I could do. I didn't. Nobody asked me, you want to go back? (laughs) Nothing like that happened for me. It was like, you go. And I felt like I was being vacuumed, like I was being pulled. And it was the sense, like if you jump from from ground zero and you feel the vacuum, like, (gasps) and now there's nothing I could do. And I knew I was back in the body when all the feelings of the heaviness, the I'm not free. I feel the uncomfortable feelings of the body, the pain, the coldness. The coldness is something even up to today, I could never take away from that, like shake away. It's like, oh. And then now is when the, the hard time came, right, because I didn't want to be back. Yeah, you know, I can't think of a single near-death experience. And I've read and talked to so many people who, who ever said, oh, boy, I'm good. let's go back to my body. It was, <laughs> it was all sort of, oh, God, I'm out of there. You know, I, I don't want to go back. And then somebody, in some cases, there would actually be a conversation where some you know, guide or being of light or something would, would say, no, sorry, you have to go back. Or, or they'd, sometimes they'd give them a choice like, okay, well, you could stay, but how about your daughter? You know, how about your kids? And they, then they think, okay, I'll go back. But, but it was always reluctantly. 
Yes, I guess at that point, because I didn't have that is a strong attachment with my parents either, with this reality, with my body, I was not asked anything. <laughs> I was just like, you're back. Have you so, given any thought, I'm sure you have over the years, to um, what it is that actually separates from the physical body and enables us to have experiences once the physical body is incapacitated or e even dead? What does that give? I, th I think our, our consciousness. Yeah. I think, we, I think we are. Rick, I have experienced things that are incredible. I, one day I woke up in my bedroom. I do. I meditate all my life. I, for, for me, meditation is, I, I say it's not a doing, it's a way of being. To, to me, I am in that state. I, I wake up three in the morning. One day I, I, I wake up and I sit in my bed. And I was bigger than the room itself. I was huge, Rick. I was huge, so huge that I couldn't even fit in the bathroom. And I even heard the words grandioso. <laughs> like, I was, oh. And I, and I have ex another one that I experienced, Rick, which shows us that we are multidimensional beings. And, and for you to explain this one, it's a little bit difficult. So I have to use analogies as an oceanographer. I use the ocean as an analogy. But... One time I went to sleep break and I'm in this deep sleep and I heard a bell. Cling, 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 cling. So to give an example with the ocean, the analogy next to it, say that at that moment I woke up and I was at the very, very deep part of the ocean. How I know? Because I woke up. I woke up feeling completely I am awake because I heard this bell. And I'm like, whoa, what was that bell? And then I heard the bell again, cling, 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 and I woke up again. I'm like, whoa, oh, what? How? Oh. And then I hear the bell again, cling, 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 and I woke up again. What the? And in all these times I woke up, I did not have any concept, idea, thought, connection with what we call Ingrid. So if I put you the ocean, I didn't have connection with the waves at the surface. It was like the deafness of, of who I am. And this bell had to sound around five times before I arrived to what I call the thermocline, where you can feel that there's, okay, the disturbance, what is happening in the, in the layers, the first layers of the ocean. And I just like, oh, oh, there's something, something that is called Ingrid. And I heard the bell again, cling, cling, cling. And I'm like, oh, yeah, there's a, there's an Ingrid thing. There's an Ingrid thing. And then I heard for the last time, it was six or seven times, Rick, when I am finally, wow, yes, I'm here. Yeah, this is the bed. My husband is, there. wow, yeah. So it's when I realized with that clarity, we are multidimensional beings and we're living at all the states of being. Yeah. Yeah, very true. Um, I've had some experiences like that too, but I won't go into them. Uh, <laughs> just uh, all kinds of interesting things, but yeah, you know, a lot of people have. Um, and you know, I, I think that we all know it on some level. Even even the most ardent atheist or materialist or skeptic, we we have to have some kind of deep innate sense that there's so much more to life than we're experiencing, such greater depth, such greater profundity. Um, it can never be entirely blotted out, don't you think? It, it cannot. Even, even when you ask me, and look, this is what made me also see children and think about children with completely different eyes. Because, of course, at the moment we see the child and the child comes with, and, and now is going to be conditioned by what we know. But when I had my near death experience, now that you ask me how I was aware of seeing myself in eternity and, and wearing different shells, like I call it, is because I came back, Rick, and now I had an awareness I did not have before. And when I look at my body, this body, I was like, I am not this child. And so you didn't forget that, did you? I mean, you know, I there you are, a little three year old, four year old, five year old, and you just knew is, you know, this is not me. <laughs> I knew, Rick, and I would look at my parents. So that was hard, too, because you will think, what is this child with her parents? But I had some 
sort of this connection at the level of I knew you're not just my biological. I know you're not this. I felt them as my equal. I couldn't relate with other children because I, I, I would look at the people, Rick, and I'd be like, what is happening with these people? They don't know anything. To me, they're like, like, what is going on? So I came already with that awareness and not just with with knowing I am more than this body, I am not this. I would look at myself in the mirror, Rick, and I said, that's not who I am. That is not my name. I, and, but I would just say I should not be here because I just didn't want to be here. And my mom, what can you do with a child like that? It's just like <laughs> my mom just tried to say, you're beautiful, don't think this way, be grateful with God, whatever. But I, and what do you do? And then I started to feel very angry. I didn't want to eat. I didn't want to even be touched by people. I didn't want to be here, Rick, because I just, for me, it's like, this is what is happening, why it's, I am here. It's not your home. You you had gone home, and all of a sudden, you're not home anymore, right? Yes, Rick. And now this is the other incredible thing, all the validation, what happened in this experience. Now I came back. And I had the abilities of, I was able to read, write, resolve mathematical problems, put together complex puzzles, to think. And yeah, I've heard my- you say that. I mean, how much of a jump in your ability was there? And did you go from like, usually people who are under three can't read at all uh, or write. Uh, did you all of a sudden right then, next next few days, start reading and writing? Yeah, but, but it wasn't like or, or like a full yeah. It wasn't Shakespeare. Um, it was so, yeah. sort of yeah, something. Yeah, it was so sort of like they will show, and you know what it happened, Rick. My, you know how children don't develop, and for my mom that was great because she was a teacher. That abstract ability until later on. Yeah, I, then I already had it huh. once I came back. So for me, I will see numbers, and it I kept that for the rest of my life. I could just see patterns. I could see how the words work. I could see how everything worked. And, and then I would just say to my mom and later in a school, when I joined a school, it was a problem because they didn't have a culture of children like me. Mm. And for the teacher is like, if you know everything, just sit in that corner and let us be because. So you know like, the answers right away, right? Oh yeah. So it was for me, a school was stupid. So I was also kind of, my mom said she never met anybody more rebellious than me. <laughs> it's funny. You know, I used to have a girlfriend like 50 years ago who was a school teacher, and um, sh- there was a kid in her class who I, I was. She was always telling me about it. Oh, this kid is such a problem. Oh man, you know what am I going to do with him? And they were thinking of holding him back a grade or something. And then somehow they figured out that the problem was that he was actually much too smart for that class, <laughs> and so they skipped him ahead of gra- a grade. And then all of a sudden, all the problems went away. You know, he he had he was more challenged. He wasn't bored, and he f- was able to fit right in. Yeah. So that's the problem when we see everybody as that all of us have to do things the same way. Yeah. And I experienced it myself. So I have problems at school because of that. And and for me, Rick, for me, was the sense, same thing that happened during my near-death experience, was the sense, I am not learning these things. I'm just remembering. I'm just remembering. I'm just remembering. So that, that was incredible. So imagine a little child also talking to their parents, subjects that, of course, I also didn't have the language to express it. We made it so hard because how I could tell them I, I, I'm experiencing these things <laughs> and there was not the understanding either. So if I would tell them I see things, I hear things, I whatever it is, they, they just didn't understand what was happening. And there's the other thing, though, Greg, this is a funny thing. This is I always say to people that after my near that experience is like the door never closed. Because I kept having out of body experiences, communicating with beings of light, all this. Then, no long ago, the beings of light said to me, Of course, the door never closed <laughs> because there is no door. Yeah. So I was like, Oh, yeah, the, what we call the kingdom of heaven, consciousness, whatever we want, to, what, whatever we want to call it, is what we are. We we are that consciousness. We are that light. So we are the ones due to conditionings, due to 
whatever, school, parents, ancestors, we are the ones that close that door. If we use the analogy of the sun, the sun is always shining. We're the one that close the shutter. <laughs> now, you've referred to beings of light several times, but you haven't really told us yet how the beings of light experience began. Was it actually in the tank you began to see beings of light or later on once you were resuscitated or what? No, it was later on, Rick. Uh, after, like I said to you, after my near-death experience, I kept, I didn't even know anything about auto warrior experiences, of course, but the concept I didn't have, but that has started to happen. That's how we know it nowadays, how I know because I will close my eyes and I would just start experiencing movements, Rick, I have never experienced here. Changes in vibration, frequencies, colors, sounds, I have never hear, see, experience here. And, I, and it was kind of scary at the beginning, <laughs> but I, I will go to the realm of the light again. So I'm like, wow. So it no matter if all these things was kind of shocking and scary, and I wanted to be in that realm of the light. And you could do so that anytime I, you wanted. No, just when I went to sleep. Oh, okay. So, so yes. You, but then later on, you learned to meditate. And maybe that became more voluntary. But in, in any uh, case, you're saying exactly. that when you were a little kid, it would be when you started to go to sleep that this happened. Yes, this would happen. And then, of course, after this, because it felt so well, I wanted to sleep more. <laughs> yes. And then what happened is in one of these journeys, one day, Rick, I, I just saw starlight figures that were shining everywhere. It's like if I, I, I to explain how, how it is, like if you're outside looking at the stars, but instead of seeing a black universe, it was all light. And the lights were shining in all different colors, all different colors, everywhere, like to the infinite. I'm like, whoa! So now imagine, I wanted to sleep forever. <laughs> 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 and then in one of these journeys, I one of these lights shaped itself into a human form. Uh. And it was shining in, in gold, pure gold light. And now let me was, ask you here. So you were you were going to sleep, but you weren't asleep yet. This wasn't a dream. You were somewhere in between or just settling in, and then you started having this experience. Yes, yes. So it was a sense I would start closing my eyes and, and then started you see to see these changes. Yeah. Color, speed, sound, and I would appear there. And then when it had a human form, this first one, um, was it like kind of very dreamlike and indistinct or was it very clear? Like you could see eyes, nose, you know, various features. No, no, just the shape. The shape. Okay. The shape kind of to show me I am like you. So it was the shape of this being. Yeah. And it touched me, Rick. And when it touched me, when I had the the clear or, or, or the, the knowing of my head in my head came, you are a being of light. So this was something you that are. happened. The, the, the knowing was that you were one or that it, that was one. That he is one. He is and one. Because, because I saw myself as a being of light during the near that experience. Uh -huh. It was the knowing we are the same. Okay. It takes one to know one, as they say. I, yes. Exactly. <laughs> And I that day I snapped away. But guess what happened? Re of course, my parents uh, tell the other lady to go because I she almost let me drown. They hire a new one. But this one also did. I mean, if a kid is sleeping, you don't have to take care of the child. So she was good that I was sleeping. So what started to happen is I wanted to take naps. I wanted to sleep all the time. So I would just go to sleep because I wanted to be there. But it's now that I understand, of course, balance is needed. At the moment, I didn't think about that, but I couldn't sleep forever. So it's when I understand why I started to see them here. One day I was taking a shower, Rick, just having, oh, this is really, really good shower. When a beam of light that was shining in bright blue, it was this bright blue intense light, it shone in the bathroom. And I'm like, oh, now the beams of light are here. And now after that, I started to see them everywhere. And this is one thing people people ask me, like how how you see them, how you hear them. At the beginning, now they really didn't need to shape into anything. I just knew. So I just saw the, the, the lights shining. And when I would look at them, and I later I will say when I started to hear voice, but 
if they would talk or they would communicate with me, it didn't matter who it was. I knew who was talking. So I didn't have to see a voice. I didn't have to hear expression. I just knew. Okay. I knew who was talking. Let me ask you a couple of mundane questions just to make this more real for me and other people. Um, so I got the impression from what you just said that it didn't really matter whether your eyes were open or closed. You, you could, it wasn't really a matter of your physical eyes. If, if it were even pitch dark, you could have seen them, right? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. And the thing is like, even not just with, I like, I like to continue going deeper with that, that you just asked, because later in life, I didn't think about that there, but later in life, I understood, I know, I understand this, this, this concept of home now. Home is not a place, it's a state of being. Because when the beings of light started to appear here in the physical realm, I started to heal, right? Mm. I started to talk to my parents. I started to feel well. I started, I want to interact with others. I started to eat my physical, I was very ill and after drowning worse. So I was like, I started to feel well. So, so I now later in life, I said, I understand. I didn't have to go anywhere. Now that the beings of life were here and I felt that sense of well being. I felt love. I felt care. I felt that I was not alone. And then this is the other thing, because I felt that I did not have attachment with my name, Rick, or with my persona. I was throwing big tantrums. And then they will call me to my name and I will get aggravated. And there was an evening that they were calling me for dinner and the lady was like, Ingrid, Ingrid, I'm like, don't call me <laughs> like that. <laughs> then I would just just ignore it. And then she came and I said, Ingrid, don't you hear? We're calling you for dinner. And I turned to her and I said, do not call me like that. That is not my name. <laughs> and she looked at me and she's like, so what is your name? To just aggravate it. And I said, I do not need one. <laughs> they must have thought you were a strange little kid. <laughs> well, of course. Everybody at his school, every, everybody thought, what is with that child? Yeah. And then that night, Rick, is when I, they sent me to bed. I was so aggravated, so sad. And it was the first time I heard I her voice for the first time. Mm. Now, the voice, was it speaking in Spanish or was it more um, pre-verbal? So it, didn't, it was conveying ideas without any specific language being expressed. You know, that's, that's incredible because I never even thought about it until people asked me. And uh -huh. then later on when I pay attention... It was like, yeah, I, I don't think there was a sense of really like a language, like right. a, or, or I cannot tell you it's a, it's a man or it's a woman. I cannot. There's none of that. So, but I have had experiences where I hear clearly a voice that is more female or male. Yeah. But with the beings of light, depending who who is talking, it, it will be different. And I didn't have the again the the sense of language. And but. There's been other occasions in my life, like when I wrote my book, everything came in English. Mm -hmm. So I wrote, and the language was English. It was amazing. Like uh, when I get many of the teachings, they come in English. So, <laughs> so you know, the pen is like a download. But I, I, but if you're kind of paying attention deeper to who's, there's not really a language. I guess we translate it that way. I would imagine that in the realm where these beings of light dwell, um, it wouldn't. It would be too gross to have a, a f physical spoken language, you know, of which there are many thousands on the earth. They would just communicate telepathically, but it wouldn't be in human language. Yes, that's why I think at the end we could, when we are at that level of, of being, we can communicate with anybody. It doesn't matter the physical language that we manage here. We can hear, we can communicate. And when, once you start having that telepathic communication, like when I talk to people, even from other countries, even people that write to me where I already have the sense, I know their, their thing, even if they can speak a different language. Yeah. Because it goes deeper than that. But another thing separate also from the language is the names. That's the first time the beings of life said to me, they talked to me like in a whisper, like they were like, Let's, this is our secret. They said to me, it's going to take time for them to understand. And I'm like, oh, 
imagine I'm, I can hear. And they say that in the realm of the light, names are not needed. Mm-hmm. You don't imagine the sense of relief that that gave me. Because it's the sense, I am not crazy. I don't need a name. I know now why I don't need a name. Because they, they said they're not needed and you already know that. So people ask me too, like, what are the names of these guys, these beings of light, these angels? And I say, I never care for a name. Yeah. Because I already know that names are not needed. But of course, later I understood here in our physical realm, in our human experience, of course, we, we're like a container, a basket. We need a name, profession. We have our uniqueness, our purpose. So that's beautiful. But beyond this realm is not needed. Yeah. I have a friend who um, had a profound spiritual awakening and and sees beings of light. And I didn't know that at first, but um, we were at a conference in California and he told me that he sees beings of light. He actually, you know, sees them clustering around people out on the patio and things like that, doing something. He didn't know what, attending to people somehow. And uh, later on, we were going home and we were in the San, in an elevator in the San Francisco airport. And uh, I was really curious about it. And I said, hey, are there any in this elevator? And <laughs> he just kind of smiled. And then we got out of the elevator and he said, he said, they said to me, don't point us out to people. If they are meant yeah. to see us, they will see us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's my experience too. They say, do not talk about us. Yeah, I mean, you can talk like understand. like we're doing right now. But if if you yeah. were, if you were sitting in a restaurant, you wouldn't, and the waiter came uh, over, you you would say, hey, you know, there's a being of light around you. <laughs> They'd probably kick no. you out of the restaurant. <laughs> yes, no, no, I don't do that. And, and also, people, you I, you know, Rick, one of the things the beings of light said to me through time, with all the the, the you know, the my book is full of teachings. But they said to me, Ingrid, your path is the path of gentleness. Mm-hmm. You're not here to convince anybody about anything. So do not interfere. Do not go saying things. Uh, now I do it because we do it for the general. And if someone wants to listen, somebody's in tune with us, they will come and listen. And if they don't, and, and if they don't agree, it's okay too. Yeah. All of us are in our own path. But now the time also arrived in my life when I met a, a person in my job, actually. <laughs> I was working at, at that moment for, for the U.S. Navy. I met a friend. And it's when the beings of light told me, you can tell her everything. Oh, cool. But by, by then, I was already 40, yeah. I think 41 years old. So all those years had passed. They said, do not, they said the time will come. Rick, they knew. And, and this is another thing that I, uh, I talk about and, and it's in my book. I started to have visions since I was four years old. And I already knew. At the beginning, I didn't know that those were visions, but later in my life, when, when things will, I will see them and they will manifest, it was like, whoa. And sometimes it was little things and later it was just other big things. But it was like, I, I remember my parents brought me to see the ocean for the first time and I was completely mesmerized. And I said to my mom, she had to actually had to kind of shake me because I would just get like, and she and I said, Mom, someday I'm going to know. But it was the knowing. It was not like, oh, I said, someday I'm going to know what is there under that blanket. And when I was five years old, I approached my dad and I said, Dad, when I grow up, I'm going to be a marine scientist. And he was just like, OK. And I imagine I was born in the ocean, in the mountains, far away from the ocean. So but I already knew these things. Right. When I was 12, I had a vision. Imagine I was born in Colombia when I thought I would ever work for NASA or nothing like that. Middle class girl didn't even think my future, nothing. What am I going to do? And then I had this vision where I was shown the exact building, the the road, the place where I was going to work. When you were 12. When, yeah. when I was 12. And when I was in this place 20 something years later, I, I, I almost floor. I told my husband, I'm going to work there. And I'm going to work there. And he's like, uh, he was lost. <laughs> That's interesting. How do you think that works? You know, Rick, there's a lot of things about, about time and how time works. But uh, I think that what we do is that we said, like, major milestones. I just say it's like we have that knowing within ourselves. We Even before we come. I know that we is what we call a pre-plan. Yeah, yeah. But so always people ask me, so we are predestined. And I said, no, no, it actually, 
It's even like it works here now. I could just decide I'm going to go to college. So I set a milestone. But what is going to happen before I have my degree? I don't know which electives I'm going to take, how many, how long I'm going to take doing these two years, three years. So I said it's the same thing. Yeah. It's like we set major goals and how we get there might vary. Yeah. And sometimes I also have experienced this. I call it, I call it like I say that the time is like I have like a ruler made of cheese. It's the horizontal and the vertical time. I think that when you have big awakenings, you cut the time. I think there's things you don't need to experience anymore. So there's certain things that were going to bring you to certain challenges, to certain things to to grow, to evolve. And you have this, wow, somehow this big awakening in your life. Now there's things you don't need. So it's like you jump and you just experience something else. I know that because all the experiences I have had. So where I just thought, why that didn't... I, that didn't happen or, or why that change was so big. And the being so light said to me, because you didn't need it anymore. Yeah, that's a good point. There's a verse in the Yoga Sutras where it says, avert the danger which has not yet come. And the idea is that you might have some load of karma coming down the pike, you know, uh, but you can actually work it off before it gets here. And so, you know, maybe you were destined to break your leg or something, but instead you stub your toe and, you know, it's just you don't have to go through the big bad thing that was going to happen. Yes, yes. Look, there was a time where I went to ask for this job. And at the time, I was like the expert in mangroves, mangrove ecosystems in Colombia. I have done this big research. So and I didn't get hired for the job. So imagine in the mind was like, oh, my, I wasn't good enough. All the stuff that we create in the head, you know, like oh, all the drama. And then, OK, I didn't get the job years later. Well, five years later, after thinking for all those years, how I could, I did not, I was the one for that job. And then five years later, four years later, I learned that the person that actually got the job was killed by the rebels. Interesting, yeah. In, in one of the field trips, and I asked the beings so like later, like, <gasps> they said, you did not need that challenge. Yeah. You might not have died, but you have, might have been really bad injured, whatever, but you did not need that challenge. So it was not for you. Well, this brings up an interesting uh, question. Um, are the beings of light like passive observers who just have a broader perspective on the whole course of, of your life? Or are they actually more like puppeteers who are sort of influencing events, like preventing you from getting that job, for instance, uh, because of the potential danger or because they happen to know that you no longer needed it? So they're actually you know, messing with the mind of the of the employer and, and saying, you know, don't give her that job. You know, Rick, I think that there's a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> because there's certain things in which I would have said, why this happened this way? This, or, or I would just say, this didn't come from me. I feel I am a vehicle, to be honest. There's certain things that I just think that I, I'm just the vehicle for things to happen. So yeah. I just open myself to that. And the other thing is that, but there's, there's, I think they were like a guide. They, they, they never have told me actually in my life why, what to do yeah, or, or, or which decisions to make. But there's times in which they act just like guidance. They suggest, but you, and I've been really rebellious in my life. So there was moments in which I would just say to them, I'm not doing that. <laughs> if I say, how could you say that to the beings of that? And even when they asked me, I, 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 when I was 19 years old, they asked me if I wanted to actually be a teacher, mm -hmm. if I wanted to keep going in this path of, of a spirit and they, being a spiritual teacher. And I said, no, I'm not going to teach anything. I don't want to teach anything to anyone. I want to be normal. I want to be like everyone else. And that was the time when I, I pretty much asked the beings of like, can you just please leave me kind of alone uh -huh. and people ask me how could you do that and i said because it's like if you have parents and at some point you go college and and you want to do your own thing but this was beautiful rick because i said your parents are always one call away it's not that hey but bye and i never saw them again but it was the sense that i could have my experience i could go in my path so I think there's a little bit of, well, like, I would just say, like, with our parents, 
They cannot force you to do anything, but that they can guide you. They can tell you, oh, Ingrid, don't do that. Look, I have had that experience. What if you, but it's my decision at the end. So I don't think we're puppets. I just think that they're guiding us. And at the end, there's, I believe, and, and I think there's this free will. Yeah, I agree. And obviously, if they were controlling every bit of our life, um, even if we had free will, but you know, but they were exerting so much control, we'd get lazy and, you know, we wouldn't develop our autonomy, you know, our self-sufficiency. And self-sufficiency, obviously, is a critical stage of development. Yeah, and challenges wouldn't be necessary because for what? Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, so we, we actually, all these experiences, I mean, at the end, life is, is here to challenge us so we can go back to to remember or, or we can go back to, to that place of realizing I am that consciousness, I am that light, I am. But if everything is being done, like you say, for us, then we will never need yeah. to. Kind of like not developing muscles because you never get to lift a heavy weight or anything. <clears throat> but there's also things that they kind of know. Like when I asked them, <laughs> there was a moment where I just, when I, I told them I, I, I want to continue doing my thing, but they, they kept saying to me, okay, I don't know, this is another story, but one day I was sitting in a bus, Rick, and, and I was looking through the window and I felt like I was an observer. This is how I felt also all my life, Rick, that I was an observer. And I asked, what is it that I am observing? And they say, life through your own personal experience. So, and I felt that with the beings of light, I was providing feedback. It's the feedback is amazing. So I was just then in this bus and, and, and then I always say, be careful with what you ask. Because at this moment, there was a lot of problems at home. My parents were close to divorce. And my sisters, you know, we we're, were all teenagers. And it was a chaos, chaos. And I'm in, in this bus and I just said, I wish none of this was real. Because in my heart, I was all these years wanted to be, to die, actually, Rick. I wanted to die. And then I said, I wish none of this was real. And the boss started to dissolve. And with my eyes open there, I am sitting and I started to have the clarity of the, the organic and inorganic constituents that made this bus possible. And I'm starting to see this like, like everything is just dissolving in trillions of particles. And I'm like, whoa, including me. And at that moment, the same thing I experienced during my near death, I experienced in that bus, it was the sense of nothingness. Like pure consciousness, pure presence. I'm like, oh. it was really fast though. And now everything was back. And I had, I have the knowing and, and, and later on through time, the being so light said to me, nothing is what it appears to be. And then at that moment, Rick, I came with two questions. How is it possible to forget who we truly are? And when we did we stop being one with the whole? When this whole separation happened? But at that moment, the being so light knew that I wasn't ready. They knew. So that's another part. It is a part of like the parents, like it's the parenting of the being so light without. They look at me and they said, or well, they told me, in 20 years, you will understand. I got mad at that moment. You said, I said, 20 years? That's like a forever and a day. And, and they said, that's what they said. I, they would never argue. That's one thing. Rick, there's no argument. They just go. Then I didn't even realize it. Nothing. My life just kept going. I had 20 years of a lot of challenges after I... The, but this is the other thing. I put the example that say that you are in a room. And for the first 19 years, I had the light on. I had the guidance of the being so light right there. I had the, the light in the room on. And at the moment, I, I decided to just say to them, eh, let me do my own thing. It's like I turn off the light in the room. He said, now you go walk your path. <laughs> then for 20 years, I had all these challenges. Of course, if you're in a room with the lights on, you see where the furniture is. You don't trip. But if you're in a room with the lights off, oh, now you're tripping with all the things in that room. So 20 years of challenges. And 20 years later, without me thinking it was 20 years, of course, I forgot the number. I forgot about it. 
And then it's when I had what I call the big awakening. Yeah, which we'll and talk things- about in detail in a bit. Yeah. It's very interesting. You know, that reminds me of a great story. Um, it was in some, somewhere in the Vedic literature. There's this master and the disciple. And the disciple said to the master, teach me about Maya. I want to understand Maya. You know what Maya means, right? The, yes, yeah. yes, the illusion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so the master said, sure, I'll teach you about Maya, but I'm thirsty. Would you go get me a glass of water first? So the disciple went off and he went to a well in a nearby village. And, um, you know, he was getting some water up from the well. And then he saw this beautiful woman there and he thought, wow, she's really nice. So they started talking and one thing led to the next and they ended up getting married and having children. And he, he started a farm and, and all this stuff, you know, whole life in that village. And then one day a big flood came. There was a great big storm and this flood came and one by one his children got washed away and his wife got washed away and everything was getting, he was about to die and he, and he remembered the master and he said, master, save me. And boom, the flood was gone and, and nothing was happening and the master was standing there and, and you know, he was like, and the master said, so where's my water? <laughs> so that was a, like a, a big lesson on how blinding Maya can be the whole illusion, but maybe we learn something that way that we couldn't learn by just some intellectual explanation or, or, or anything we have. Uh, that leads to a question I was going to ask you is that why does everybody have to go through all this? You know, life can be so difficult, even more difficult than your life. And, you know, you haven't told us everything that happened, but there were some pretty difficult parts. There were so many people who were having a really rough time. What is the evolutionary value of that? You know, if God is a loving God and if enlightenment is the purpose of of everything ultimately, why do people have to go through such a hard time? I think because, again, we we ponder the the, the question of love, but it's because we're trying to look that love and that joy and that happiness outside ourselves. Life is not here, Rick, Rick to give us the happiness. Life is not here to give us the joy. Life is here to challenge us. So we can find that joy, that happiness, that love within ourselves. And when we are keep looking outside, life is going to shake us harder, saying, go look inside. No, but I want to look outside. Then it will shake you harder. No, you look within. And there's moments in which people have to go through very bad sickness to even to prison to finally stop. Life shake you so hard that you stop. And it's just when you I, I say you do the, the go to that place where you pretty much close your eyes, close the idea of thinking the world is give have to give me this. And you start finding it within. There's nothing I have to look outside because I am it. But if you don't get shaken that hard, you don't see it. You will always pursue it as something that is outside of you. And you will think you are in lack because incredibly, we always have been that. I always like the question that says, if if the, the core of who you are is joy, love, happiness, Peace, silence, greatness. The real question is, what am I doing to disturb that? So if we keep looking outside, life is going to come with these challenges to show us, stop looking. You're not lacking this. You are this. That's why when people, and and in all the teachings, when they said, don't look for enlightenment. Enlightenment, you're already enlightened. Don't look for what you already are. The more you seek, the less you find, the, the more confused you are because you're looking, you, it's in a labyrinth. You're already that. You're already that presence. You're already that light. You're already that silence. So the question is that, how I remove the blocks. I, I love this analogy that came to me lately, Rick. It's like you have a bulb, like that lamp back there. And the bulb has its own, it has its beautiful bulb. That's what we are, this light. But we put a shade on it. The conditioning, they tell us whatever it is, the beliefs. What? We put a shade on it. You're not this, you're not that, or you're this, or you're that. And then after that, I like to always have a cloth, drop it on me. And you put another cloth, and another cloth, and another cloth, until that light that you are cannot shine. It is shining, but cannot be seen, cannot express itself. It's under all these layers, layers of clothing or or shades. 
and then what we have to do and what life is going to challenge us to start removing these blocks, removing these shades. I say, people, look an onion. What do you do to get to the core of the onion? You have to remove the layers. But what happens when you remove the layers? What happens when you chop an onion? You cry. You cry a lot. So that's what happened. Is is it, it hurts to remove all these layers and realize I am not any of this. Until you get to that light of who you are. One time I we were talking about vibrational frequency with some people. Hey, vibrational high, low vibrational frequency, blah. And the beings of light that night told me, Rick, there is only one true frequency. God's frequency or source frequency, or consciousness frequency. It's the same the idea with the bulb. There's the bulb is always shining. These measure of frequencies, how far or how, how many blocks have you put around yourself to stop being that light? The more you remove, the more connected you are, the higher the frequency, the higher the vibration. The more shades you put, the less you shine your light. So how would you answer this question? Why can't we all just come in as little children and, you know, kind of have the kind of knowing that you had after the tank, but without having to drown, you know, just we grow up knowing that stuff naturally and we don't cover ourselves with a thousand covers that block our light. We just sort of enjoy growing into our full potential and live a beautiful life. How come life doesn't, how come we have to get all lost and confused and, or, and find our way back again? I could give an answer to this question, but I want to hear, hear what you would say. <laughs> you know, Rick, I just, I just say, even with, with the experiences I, I had, like when I said I turned off the, the light, I realized how easy it was to get lost, how easy it was to forget. So I think anyways, like in the experience I had in the tank and, and through all my life, the, the realization I am an eternal being is because a long time ago we turned that switch off. <laughs> It's not just in this life. The fact that we die, look, I have this experience, Rick. I started to see spirits when I was six years old. So the fact that we come to this life right now doesn't mean we are awakened, doesn't mean that baby is awakened yet. Yeah, it's pure and innocent. But the fact, just to to, to show you how I learned it, I, I started to see spirits when I was six. And the spirits caused me fear. So I asked the beings, I, I told my mom at that moment, I already knew my mom could see spirits and all that. So when you and say the, spirits, you mean spirits, not beings of light, but you started to see spirits. Spirits, spirits. Yeah. And, and again, like this, this question of vibration, I felt something different. I like felt lower vibration. Uh, yeah. Yes, lower vibration. And they caused me like terror. It was like, whoa, what is with this stuff? And then um, I went to my mom when I saw the first spirit and I told her, mom, the beings of light and the spirits are not the same. And then my mom started to, do, okay, explain them well, that is it that you see. And I just explained and she's like, whoa, she almost started to cry. And she's like, I think that you see angels. And I just said to her, no, mom, I don't think they're angels because they don't have wings. So my mom was like, oh, but they have to be your guardian angels because of the light and the stuff. So because I've been talking with them for a while and I went and I asked them and I said to them, mm, what is with these spirits? Because they cause me fear. And then I, I thought the answer was going to be right. Like, oh, they are different, whatever. And then at that moment, the answer was incredible because they say that thing that you call a spirit, you and us, we're all the same. The only difference is the level of awareness you have about who you truly are. And just with your example with, with, with the well, how easy it is to forget who we are, how easy it is to get tangled. The, the beings of light show me a, a kaleidoscope. And the light that comes, the, the, the source light, and they show me the, 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 you know how it forms all these beautiful images of light and color. And they said, people think that that's the real thing when that is the illusion. So we get trapped in the illusion and it's so easy to get trapped there. 
So I think we, we leave home because like you, like happened with this analogy that you or this story about this teaching, you you leave and you get trapped in the illusion and it's, and it's so sweet and it looks so good and it feels so great. Then now is your trip to go back and realize this is not the truth. Yeah. And, and I think I by the time you get back to it, you re- you appreciate it more. Having gone through the whole rigmarole, you appreciate it more. You appreciate it more, exactly. And, and, and now this is the other thing. At that moment, I also ask the beings of light. My mom said that you are angels. Is that what you are? And the answer was incredible because they said, you can call us whatever you want. And the other thing was, it's like pretty much it was... They expressed to me, we are to you whatever you want us to be. So see, even that is a part of the illusion when, when we are, because all, all of these is an expression of consciousness. Is that the kaleidoscope showing us, look at all these. But all these at the same time, again, like we're talking, is bringing us back to that place of remember who you truly are. And appreciate that like yeah, greatly, deeply. This conversation reminds me of a poem by T.S. Eliot. He said, uh, we shall not cease from exploration and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Oh, I I love that. Oh, yes. That's beautiful. Yes, yes. So I I even have a story, a story in my book, which is really, really cute. I was uh, five years old and it was an aunt. I I think I never told this story other than in the book. And she was so mean. And she came to me and she told me, ah, this could be a good answer for this. And she told me that uh, she said that my mom didn't love me. Because she was, uh, she she always wanted conflict with my mom. She was very envious of my mom. There was a lot of problems between them, and she this aunt being so mean, me five years old, and she said, "Your mom don't love you because you don't look like your sisters. Look at you with these dark eyes." And she always kept my hair short because I'm curly, so she didn't know what to do with this curly hair and. So I I was just I felt what my mom don't love me, and she said, and by the way. You're, you're not your dad's daughter because my dad was blonde with blue eyes and my sister looked more like him, my sisters, and I did. So imagine how this person is so bad to put <laughs> these thoughts in a child. And then I was so um, suffering and unbelieved what she said. And, and my parents, I started to really be like bad. Like I was throwing tantrums. I was like, and being so like tried to, talk to me and I didn't want to listen. So yeah, I was rebellious. So <laughs> she has to be right because it's true. My sisters are beautiful and I'm not. So an aunt came to visit and I went to live in her house for a while because my parents thought maybe this is the solution. Maybe she should go somewhere for a while and she'll come down <laughs> and she will learn to appreciate. And then they sent me away. Then now I thought my, my aunt is right. They're getting rid of me. Then I had all this experience of being away from home and feeling what was to be away from home. And finally, I got really depressed there. I wanted to come back home. So look at all the challenges I had to experience of going to this place, leaving home, to come back and and realize I want to be home. I really appreciate home. And this was the first time in those five years of my life that I finally felt that I had some place in in, in my human, in my in my in my home as human. Yeah, and to sort of rehash the same cycle on a larger scale. If you think of everything you've been through in your life, from drowning in the tank, and then everything you went through for several decades, and then finally having this awakening, which we haven't talked about yet, but we will. Um, you know, think how well you're able to function now and explain things and do things from the uh, from on the foundation of that awakening than you were when you were three years old and you had just had this experience in the tank and you didn't know what was going on. So you really had to go through all this stuff in order to um, be a much more capable representative of, you know, that deeper reality. <clears throat> Yes, exactly, Rick, because that was like that. All these things were happening for me in a natural way. 
like I, I was, uh, I don't know, I, I think by 17, I started to be able to communicate with plants. I could hear the plants. I was having all these access. I could. Uh, what would the plants say? Lives. Oh, no, sounds. It was in, oh, but there was some, some that. knowledge, some, some, inf- yeah, some transmission. Uh, yes. At the beginning was, I started to be able to hear the grass. And I was like, oh, it here like almost like a symphony. Like this was incredible, uh, something I have never heard. And I asked the beings, so like, what is going on? And they say, it's welcoming you. Interesting. People do not know that the nature welcomes them and like, like a symphony of sound and we don't even know. I once met this um, Indian um, sage. He was really a sage, but his, he was a specialist in plants and, and herbs and things like that. And he said that the, the plants would talk to him and tell him what, they were, what their purpose was in terms of some medicinal value. He could just wa- wander down the path and the plants would actually communicate what they were for. So yes, there was that level yes. of communication. I, I had a similar experience like that. I, I was studying the, the bug remedies for, for the, he did it from flowers. And I was in one of these retreats and they put all these plants in front of us. And that was the first time that I, they, they said, write on, on this paper what you feel the plants are telling you. Ah. It was part of the whole retreat. And it's when I, I wrote all the answers right. So I, I got freaked out. I didn't <laughs> even realize I was having communication at that level with the plants. But again, Rick, at the time, I didn't understand my uniqueness. I didn't understand why I was different. I didn't understand why these things were happening to me. And then uh, for me, I didn't really want to share it with most people. I didn't, it was apart from my grandmother. I was going to transcendental meditation to all these things, doing all these spiritual things, but I was always very quiet. And there's a moment where the heaviness of wanting to be like everyone else was really hard because I had now three sisters. They were beautiful and the boys and the parties and life. And then I started college and I was like, I, I'm tired of being different. So I couldn't really appreciate all these gifts I, like the way I do now. I could not really understand what was happening. So yeah, I had to go through all, all those I think it's, it's maturity mm-hmm. and at all levels, uh, psychologically, emotionally, mentally, to, to be able to be where I am today. Yeah. A question actually came in um, from a, a fellow named William in, te- in Houston. And um, he um, has been following you, he said, since seeing you at the IANS conference, International Association of Near-Death Studies conference. And his question is, do you think that NDE teachers like Anita Morjani, yourself, and others have profound messages to teach the world about spirituality and how to evolve? It's a two-part question. That's the first part. I I, I think that not just near their experiences. As I think that anybody that has gone through through profound, profound, I would just say a spiritual experiences, profound experiences that bring us to realize who we truly are. Yeah. You don't need to drown to do that. <laughs> oh, you don't need to drown, no. And I and I said, yeah, it's better if you don't. Right. So so yeah, just and, and it's not like anybody that also has to be no, start doing the work because people ask me, like, how can I get there? How can I hear beings of light? And, and but they don't want to do the work. And they say, What is the work? At the beginning is work. But it, like I said, meditation for me is not a doing from I started to meditate when I was eight years old, Rick. And and for me, meditation, I um, finally it was like, wow, to me it's a state of being, but it, it started as a doing. So for me it's like But even when you're I, eight, it was pleasant from the beginning, right? It wasn't a, oh, it wasn't yes. difficult. No, it was extremely pleasant. It was incredible. When I was twelve, my grandmother brought me to the first Buddhist temple. And this was like unheard in Colombia. But that was the thing. The beings of life said people will come to your path to guide you and to help you. And that just happened. So like you, like you said, there's things that are being worked out anyways. Like we at all levels of being, we work together. The beings of life, like here on earth, there's also beings working with us at all levels. So my grandma took me to this temple and I did this. There was the first breathing meditation technique. Rick, and I am just, 
And I felt this feels so good. I, and, and at that moment, I started to remember past life since I was also very young. And it was the sense I, I already have experienced things like this. And then uh, when we were to leave, I told the, the monk, I said, we, we cannot come back. My grandma is a very busy woman. And he said, oh, don't worry. Don't worry, child. He said, you don't never have to come back because you already have a temple. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, you are the temple. So whenever, wherever you can practice this breathing meditation. And for me, that was key, Rick. From that day, it's like, oh, I am a temple. So I, I kept just manifesting and doing. But when nowadays I tell people the work is to calm the mind. That is who I look, Rick. When I had my near experience and I mentioned to you, what I knew is that Part of the, that essence that I am, that is just, of course, absolute presence, but it was silence. It was that space of calmness, peace. And I don't say silence or, or noise. It, it, it was calmness, silence of, th- silence of thought, silence of, of all the stuff that we accumulate inside ourselves. It was like a spaciousness. So when I said people to, because they asked me, how can I connect with beings of light? I said, you have to quiet your mind. And the work of quieting your mind, and I said, go walk in meditation, do whatever, all these different practices for you to start learning quieting your mind. And the more you quiet your mind, the more space you create, the more you remove those blocks and you take those sheets off. And now you're vibrating. How are you connecting with everything? Yep. The second Chap, second verse of the Yoga Sutras says, yoga is the cessation of the fluctuations of the mind. And, and then the next verse says, and then, the, and then you rest in the self, you know. So ancient teaching. And, um, and people yes. shouldn't feel, and I'm, I'm among the people who are listening to this, perhaps some people meditate and some never have, and maybe some have tried it and it's been difficult and they think it. But, you know, if you go about it right, as I know you, you know, um, it's not only enjoyable in and of itself, so it's no big chore or it doesn't take a great deal of mm-hmm. self-discipline to do it, And but then the after effects are enjoyable. So it's kind of a win-win situation. And um, and one other thing I'll just throw in there is that the I don't think, I think you and I would both agree that the goal of meditation or spiritual practice is not to see beings of light. That That might be a side mm-hmm. effect. Uh, it might happen to some people and not to others, but that's not the essential purpose of it. Completely, completely agree with you. So that's when I say, people, if you have a goal, you're going to be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so I say, people, do it because it, it, it is you. You're touching the essence of who you are because it feels great. Because it's just you're it becoming in touch with your light with the spaciousness of who you are. You know, this analogy that is so beautiful, the beings are like, they just come with these things. The other day, they, they showed me a room, and it was just a room, and they said, what is the thing that never, ever changes in this room? And I already have heard about these teachings that are similar, and I said, of course, the space. The space. And then they started to, to show me furniture, and, and then they said, see, that's the key. What are you identifying with, the furniture or the space? Always be vigilant. Are you being the furniture or are you being the space? So that's always I something carry. Like when I know that I'm, I'm being carried away by my, my emotions, my thoughts, I stop. I am not that. I am not the furniture in the room. I am the space. So it is you go calm because the space is oh, it's just you go to that place of resting in calmness. Many times, Rick, I, I have days where I go in and experience again that state of non-self. I, I I wake up in the morning and and people say, oh, you cannot say that time time always exists no matter what. And I said, wow, when I am in the state of absolute presence, calmness. 
when there's not a story, to me, there's no time because time is a measure of change. And if I, in my awareness, there's no story, there's no change. And these are moments in which you're just in this state of absolute presence. Ah, it's incredible. The time is a relative thing. I mean, even physics, not even physics, physics um, totally understands that. I was just listening to a talk by a physicist named Roger Penrose, and he was saying that for a photon, there is no time. And what he means by that is that the photon, let's say, coming from the Andromeda galaxy two, two million light years away, from our, from our perspective, it takes two million years for it to get here. From its perspective, it's traveling at the speed of light, and so time and space have completely collapsed, and it makes the trip instantaneously. Um, so, mm -hmm. so time is a relative. It's, it's very relative. I asked the beings of light, like, what is the purpose of time? And the answer was awesome. They say, the purpose of time and experience is to help you remember who you truly are. So once you remember, it's not needed anymore. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, William from Houston had a second part to his question. He said, um, okay, so he said, you know, do you guys have, prof you and Anita and people like that have prof profound messages to teach the world about spirituality and how to evolve? If so, what does that look like in the realm of education, business, and the how-to of carrying the message forward? So what I think he's saying is, you know, okay, you and Anita have written books and you give talks and, you know, and many other NDE people have done those things. And, um, but wouldn't it be nice if, you know, actual education that millions of children get or businesses that millions of people work in and things like that could, um, could enjoy this kind of insight? And, and how would that come about? How would you introduce it to in, in those fields? You know, Rick, it's starting to actually happen. I just uh, recently, uh, I was part of a study. We, I think 20 people, 20 something, we wrote this incredible, they were doing a study of, of near their experiences. And there was like 22 articles or something we wrote for John Hopkins University. And, and it, it was for this incredible magazine, it's called Nib. And this study just gathered all these um, experiences. And the idea is that it's starting to show to the medical community and to the, the, the cleric that these experiences happen and that the, the um, uh, patients that come back with a memory or with something like this cannot be disregarded because actually that will harm more the patient than helping the patient. So we're trying to, it is actually happening. It's starting to introduce these concepts and, and start helping people. I, I do sessions with people online and already this is beautiful. Rick, I have had few people that have children because um, the article I wrote and a lot of the talks I, I give, of course, I, I, I am a child uh, near that experience. I, had, I was so little and life so hard. So now people are coming to me and saying, I understand what is happening to my child. I, somebody even looking at my experience realized that her child she had an either experience, this, this child had been suffering so much and the mom could not understand, but you're back, God brought you back, you're being disgraceful, whatever. And she saw my talk and she realized, oh my God, I get it, my, my daughter is grieving. My daughter is grieving because she had to come back. For the first time, this mom understood and we had this incredible dialogue. I was able to talk to the girl, Rick, up to that point, the girl, she was in this state of like complete distraught, quiet, she wouldn't talk. And we got together. Oh my God, now the girl is another person. <laughs> That's great. Yes, and it happened with another girl that could see spirits and she was put in an institute for uh, mental illnesses. And, maybe, and the moment that girl and I connected, I said, I wish I would have met you when this just happened. So we are, we're actually doing the work little by little, we're introducing these and, and there's more openness. And, and because I guess it's happening at levels of not just, um, I think it's so important to mention that because it's also happened to doctors, neuroscientists, scientists, teachers, psychologists, everybody's opening to it. It's like, oh, so this is not just something to happen 
to I don't know it's it's sad that it has to happen this way but you know credibility happen sadly when it is experienced by a doctor yeah by a yeah sure they have the credentials by, by a exactly and now these people can come and say well yes this is real yeah no, that's good. I mean, science is the predominant influence of our age. And so if spirituality is really going to go mainstream, it seems to me science is going to have to understand it and explain it in its own language and kind of give it the stamp of approval. And, and then it can be accepted. Yes, yes, exactly. So I think, I, uh, and that's the, the other thing. People ask me always about that, that difference between science and spirituality because I am a scientist. Yeah. <laughs> And I said, and I, through all these years, that's the other thing, Rick, I, I just came to, to the realization, the separation is in the mind. Because if the essence of who you are, again, going back to that, is that of love, compassion, kindness, great, because it all depends what you think that spirituality is. If it's a spirituality, it's be your authentic self, is be the core of those principles, and you're already spiritual in whatever you do. You're you carpenter, doctor, I don't know, driver. But if you're already that embodiment of who you truly are, then you're already spiritual. That's what all this is about. Go back to the core of who you are. Go back to that essence of who you are and be that. <laughs> Look, Rick, when I, I after I had my big awakening that we haven't talked about yet. <laughs> we should talk, we should talk about that soon. <laughs> and I and I was working still with NASA and then with the Navy. It's when I was like, oh, how can I tell everybody? How can I tell everybody how this feels? Because it was this state of, of clarity, of connection, of like, oh, I know who I am. I became aware that I am awareness. <laughs> so how I, and I said, as the beings of life, how can I do, what can I do, or what can I say? And look at the answer. This tells you a lot, Ray, because the answer was do or say nothing. And they say the light of your awareness is all they need. So they said at that moment, be that light. And that's the teaching of all the, the, the things ever. Walk your talk. Just teach by be example. That. Exactly. Be that. And the, and the saying and the doing will come from being, not from the head. So that's the big difference right there, Rick. So I, it was that. So I, I, I actually started, I said, People, it's incredible because a spirituality is science. Why is science? Because you have to become an observer of yourself. And you become an observer of yourself and you catch yourself. It's awareness. You're inviting awareness into your life and it's experiential. Because it's not about believing things. Oh, you hear this? Now go try it. Go try to be kind. If you don't know you're kind, go try and see what happens. Try to be loving, try to respect, try to this, oh, calm your mind and see what happened. It's experiential. So I go do it and I was in the corridors and I would just be in a state of presence and emanating that light. Look, Rick, even the most grumpy guy in the corridor would stop and smile. And people would say to me, you know, everybody in the agency. And I said, no, I don't. In, not in person. But when we are connected at that level, when you are emanating that light, <laughs> people will notice. You are experiencing, you're the experiment. You, life is a laboratory. Just use it. Do the experiment. You see it works. Yeah, no, that's great. <clears throat> I love what you say there. <clears throat> um, it's too bad that spirituality or religion has spent thousands of years making a big fuss about belief and oh you're a believer you're not a believer you know okay burned at the stake because you're not a believer or whatever um whereas really the whole thing is about experience and it doesn't matter tremendously much whether you believe it or not if you if you experience it then it's absurd to use the word belief you know i wouldn't yes. i wouldn't say i believe i'm looking at my hand it, you know it's not the right word because it's an experience Exactly. I mean, look, this is key. The being so light said to me since I was very young, Rick, they said to me, even to them, they say, do not believe in anything we're telling you. 
Do not believe in us. Do not believe in anything. But keep an open mind. That's the key. An open mind is what is going to just discover the, the, the potential of everything. So that even the beings of life were saying that to me. Do not believe in anything, but keep an open mind. So, and that's what I did since I was I was very little. And I, people will tell me, go, but, and I would say, I, I don't. So nowadays, when people ask me, do you believe in this? Or whatever, I've written my book, my experiences, whatever. I say, I don't believe in anything. <laughs> I know. I know. And what I don't know, then I go and, and, and I go deeper and I try to, and I ask the questions and I, I try to experience it and I do it for myself. Yeah, I remember one time Oprah Winfrey was interviewing Eckhart Tolle and she was doing this little thing where she would start a sentence and let him finish it. And so she started a sentence that he, she said, I believe, and he said, nothing in particular. <laughs> 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 yeah so it's like yeah i don't i say i don't believe in anything yeah but what i know i know yeah Period. and i would say that that extends to things like god and angels and all kinds of stuff that people in the past would say are matters of belief but for you it's come more into the realm of experience exactly so it, for me it's annoying i i and I don't have to believe in anything. <laughs> and that's what made me very rebellious since I was little, right? Because even at a school, I was in the Catholic school and I would go to the priest and I said, and I said, why you fear? What are you talking about fearing God? That you're actually walking away from God. Oh my God, this guy was so mad at me. <laughs> you're just a child. What do you know? Those are thoughts of the devil. Uh, and I just look at the guy. Yeah, because I... Uh, I said, but I had experience that I didn't have that concept of God. So when people ask me, did you see Jesus? Did you see God? I don't know. I was two years old. I didn't have a concept of a God. But I knew that that there was just goodness, Rick. I knew goodness. I knew greatness. I knew peace. I knew I even didn't know the word love. That's why I don't mention it during my near-death experience. But it was now that I know the word, it was love pure greatness. We've kind of talked about this, but you were saying earlier how the major events of one's life are chosen or predestined or some such thing. I mean, you must feel, I kind of get the sense in reading your book, that it was not an accident that you fell into the tank. It was kind of a, like an initiation almost, where you had to be shifted into this other realm. And that was a way of doing it. You know what? It was not an accident. No. Oh, yeah, that, yeah, that's for sure. And to answer one of also one of the que the, the questions that I forgot his name uh, that from Houston, Andrew, I think, or the Andrew the ask is like if we come with a message. Actually, if there's a purpose behind our experiences. That that's the other thing with with all of these. Once I started to have more clarity, and I the, the beginning of life said. Learn to ask the right questions and you will receive the right answers. Mm, good point. Yeah. <laughs> so I started to ask the right questions that are actually simple. It's not complicated. And I just started even asking questions, simple questions, read like why my near death experience happened when I was so young. And the answer was because you were old enough to remember, but young enough not to be conditioned yet. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So that was key. That was important. And the other thing, I said to the beings of life, why my near-death experience happened? How simple. But I never asked. <laughs> so now I got the answer. They said to bring back the message of the purpose of, not the purpose, the power. of connection. Right. And then I said, how come? Because I see there's things that even happen to us and we don't see it. And they said, look. So now they brought me to see the experience and they said, look, when you saw your body, what was your first answer to that? And look at how 
the egoic mind at that moment is not the one making the decision. So what was my decision? Rick said, I'm not going back to that body. And what the beings of light said, that was still your egoic mind. Guess what? That That is not what the purpose of the universe wanted for you. So that's when we're playing the game of what do we do and what the universe, see? What is that we're coming to do? So this pre-plan was that, no, you're coming back. So this thing that you're leaving your body is not true. And they said, reason why you went to look for the help of the lady and the help of your mom, which I didn't have awareness even that I was looking for help. (laughs) But that's what the universe, I was coming back. So I said, okay, so if I was going to come back and I was going to look for help, why did I stop in the maid's room? Why did I waste time? And they said to me, that's that's the point. That's the point of contrast. And I said, what do you mean? And they said, look, when you went to look for the, the mate, she did not have connection with you, so she could not hear you. What happened when you went to look for your mom? Look, complete connection. And that's what we call unconditional love. Love doesn't have barriers, right? To the point that there was not a spiritual realm and a physical realm. It's love, complete connection. So my mom sends her whatever it was and she came back. And then they say, look, the person that was so far away from home was the one that got you out of the tank. The person that was only a few feet away didn't even know you were there. Then they said to me, look, with this lady, look what happened when there is connection. Your mom saved you. Look what happened when there is no connection. And look at this was beautiful. They say when there is no connection, they will let you drown. When there is no connection, there would be war. Yeah. So imagine if there were a deep connection between everybody in the world. Exactly. We didn't have to have all this craziness that is happening. That reminds me of the story of when you were almost raped on that beach and you you suddenly you kind of grabbed the guy by his chin, I think, and looked into his eyes and you made a connection and the, the connection shocked him. And so he, he left. Yes, that is story is incredible, incredible. Because at that moment, Rick, is when I realized there is no enemy. There is the idea of an enemy, the illusion of an enemy. He thinks he's an enemy. I think he's an enemy because there's conditioning, all the layers of conditioning. But at that moment at the beach, when all that fell off, that man and I, I felt the sense we are one. Mm. There's a lady named Isira um, who I interviewed maybe six months ago from Australia, and she was literally being beaten to death um, by this guy. And she needed, she eventually she needed reconstructive surgery and all kinds of stuff. But in the midst of that, she suddenly had this shift where she just felt love and she just saw everything as one. And she loved this guy that was beating her to death. And he, he had this like look of total shock on his face and he ran away. He just left. Yes, it was the same thing here. So look, your question again, why we go through hard stuff? Because those moments are cru- that that will maybe not sometime at the moment. In, in my experience, it happened at the moment, but in so people will happen later. They will tie the notes, and they will say, oh, "Thanks to that, this happened, and thanks to that, this, and thanks to this illness, now I am more compassionate. I'm more. I have more empathy. I have more love. I open this organization. See, it's like." Everything, I just know that behind every experience, there's a purpose. So I said, I said to people, don't stay in the experience. Go deeper, go deeper. Don't stay in the near death. Go deeper. Don't stay, go, there's always something behind. And with that guy on the beach, it was not just me having the experience that day. The being so like said to me, for all the experiences you're going to have that are like that, there will be a witness. And this witness, it would transform the life of this So your witness. boyfriend was there and he, yeah. Yes. And he was an atheist. He didn't believe in anything. Imagine when he sees that this guy, three guys in a row were going to rape me, kill us. Every, the, later, the police said this is a miracle because we're looking for a series of murders that have happened in this area. 
And then he said, how this is possible? And also because I knew that the guys were going to come back because I knew that that um, moment of clarity, I would just say clarity will going to go away. And I, I said to him, they're coming back. So we were able to climb this mountain high. And he said, how did you know they were coming back? How is it possible that they let us go? What just happened? And I said, if you didn't believe in guardian angels, in protective forces, whatever, in God, it, this is the time. And this changed the life of this person. Tell the one about when you were walking along with your boyfriend and some homeless people came up and started robbing you and what, what, your, boy, what your boyfriend experienced then. Oh, that was another incredible one. It, again, this changed the life of this person for the rest of his life because he was at the time very angry. He didn't believe in anything. He thought that life was unfair because he had a, a birthmark genetic, sort of thing. Birthmark, yeah. So he was very angry at that. And then we were walking in the street and I already kind of talking to him about his spirituality. I've been showing him things that were happening, even like light coming out of my hands, things like that at that level. And he was like, no, that has to be some explanation for that. So that day we're walking, Rick, and three homeless people started to come towards us. And I just, in Colombia, I mean, you see that and you know you're going to be robbed. It's like, oh, there's not another way. So we just kind of held hands thinking maybe they will let us go. No, they came. And they surrounded us and they were started to take everything from him, his wallet, his everything. And he was in such shock, like he couldn't take his watch and they were saying, give, give us your watch. And I'm standing in the scene, Rick, and I cannot move. And I have one person right here and the other. And I, I am again, like I am observing. I am an observer of this scene. And then they grab his watch since he didn't do it and they scratch his arm he was bleeding and then finally they left with everything and at that moment i was able to now talk and i said santi your, your arm is is uh bleeding they took your watch they took everything and he's like ingrid i don't care about the watch i don't care about the bleeding i don't care about nothing the only thing i care is that you were not here they didn't rob you they didn't take anything from you because you were not here in other words and in other words you became invisible i became invisible and that's what changed his life of course i mean <laughs> before an experience like that he became a spiritual he started he had an awakening and he started to use his own experience and his his burn mark and everything to just grow in empathy compassion to all that but that was incredible. And I asked the beings of that later. I didn't know you could make people disappear. And they said to me, Rick, by now you should know that nothing is impossible. Mm. Probably that you were invisible to the robbers, too. Yeah, yeah, I, I actually was because they were standing here. They, they, took, they didn't they, take your they, stuff. Nothing. I had a leather jacket. I have my wallet, my money. Nothing. It's like I was not in the scene. Yeah. You know that I invisibility was, is one of the um, cities that Patanjali talks about as being something a yogi can do this was this was incredible i have i have learned about later in life yeah that, that is uh, i think they talk about the the three big uh things a yogi can do i think is invisibility and vulnerability uh, there's um, a whole bunch of them levitation all kinds of things yeah yeah, yeah and i'm like wow so that, yeah that's incredible and but the answer of the beings of light was amazing. By this point, you should know that nothing is impossible. Yeah. Well, we've kept everybody in suspense for quite a while. Let's talk about your big awakening experience that you had, the big shift. Yes. And that's that, that's that's a, a little bit long, but we can, we will shut it. But it's like um, after all those sufferings for all those years, finally I I, I reached the point, Rick. I, I just in this, the point of my my big despair. <laughs> But at this point in my life, I had a trip planned to uh, the, the Middle East. I was going to have this, this trip. And I went to actually to Singapore, made, met, met this lady. We became friends. And she said, you have to come with me to meet the Dalai Lama. And finally, that all happened. I went there. I, I, I spent like a week with him receiving his teachings. And 
what this did at that moment, after I've been kind of so busy doing science and walk away from a lot of the spirituality, everything, I haven't done anything like that for so long. I went to meet him and at that moment was that sense of like, I have walked away from what had given me the greatest joy in my life. The silence, the beings of light, the spaciousness. I, it been so many challenges, sufferings, angers that I have forgotten. Incredibly, I, I forgot. I like we were talking before, and then it just came back. And I remember being sitting next to the Dalai Lama, holding his hand and thinking, in the like I said in the library of my mind, ten thousand questions. Like, what can I ask him? And at that moment, I realized. I need to go back to silence. And then I came back home after that trip and it's when I went into the biggest depression of my life because I have, at that moment I realized how, how could I forget who I am? How could I allow all these sufferings and all these silly stuff to get me? And I felt disconnected. And then I have been disconnected forever from others, from my own self. And then I fell in the deepest depression of my life, Rick. And I wanted to actually kill myself. It's when you touch button. And one day I'm lying in the bed with my little David next to me, which was the, the thing that just kept me here. I mean, you know, I would do anything for my little boy. And the, this thought... Imagine how thoughts can be so, the ego, so cunning, so crazy. And I had this tiny thought, what if I will live, what if we live together? What if we die together, <laughs> pretty much? And at that very moment, I just opened my eyes and said, I, I lost it. How could I even think this way? I mean, this is sick. I, I really am losing my mind. And that was the first time for many years I had to stop meditating, praying, everything, because I was angry at many things. And at that moment, Rick, I went into this profound state of prayer. And I didn't ask for things to change around me. When I went into that prayer, I asked to have clarity. I said, God, help me see because I cannot see. I am blind. I cannot see. And then I went into this deep prayer. Help me, help me. And the next day I got up and it was, I, I would say that these things are so simple. It's nothing, nothing too complicated. It was, ding, this thought, you need help. Good to see a psychologist. But it was not a thought like, oh, I might go, you know, it was not the thoughts of the ego. I might do. No, it was clear. And I just went to my computer, look, because I have never wanted help from anybody up to that point. Me, psychology, which, come on, I am a scientist. I, I don't need help. But no, it was clear. I went, I typed a name. I found this guy. I wrote the name on a paper. And the same day, Rick, two other people. One was like, my daughter is visiting these psychologists, and it was the exact same name. And he's great. And another person. So when three at the same day, three things and I have written his name on a paper and I said, look, I have this same person here. So three people, it was three things that told me about the same person. I said, oh, this is a synchronicity. This is a message. So I went to meet that guy. And incredibly, he was an amazing psychologist that was very spiritual. So that was a person open to listen. So I started with, with, with really uh, simple things and then I would drop a nugget or something kind of like this. He's going to think that I lost that thing. No, the guy was always he got just, it. Yeah. yeah, he got it. And so there was a moment where he asked me uh, that he wanted me to write a list of sufferings. And then I wrote this list, but I thought first, I am a scientist. I don't write sufferings, but oh, well. I'd see the arrogance. <laughs> then I wrote this list of all these sufferings. Bling, bling, bling. And when I, I show him the list, he looked at the list and he said, in his own experience, of course, I, there's people that have suffered more things than me. But in his own experience, he said, this is the first time I have seen some somebody, I see somebody that suffered this much and is mentally stable. I've never seen someone like this. He said, wow. 
But I was shocked, Rick. I'm like, I didn't never, never thought I was the one that suffered the most or why he's saying this. And at that moment, I said to him, why me? Why this is happening to me? And the answer was amazing. Again, so simple. He said, why not? What? The moment he said, why not? And he was incredible because this is the power of listening. When I realized that he had been listening, that's connection. When he started, he didn't never have a notepad. And at that moment, he said, look, thanks that you did this. You've been here. Thanks to you, did that. this happens. Thanks to this, this. Thing. And I'm like, whoa, and all my neurons, all my, everything started to connect. And I started to find purpose behind all my experiences, right? Like, ding, ding, ding. And at that moment, I just say to people, I, I stop being a victim. I, I stopped being at the level of the effect. And I became the cause. I, I started to see, I am, all this is not happening to me, it's happening for me. And then even the most crazy stuff, the things I hated the most, everything at that moment makes sense. And for me, I, I came into the state of absolute gratitude, Rick. It was, I don't have to change anything. I don't want to have to delete anything. I don't have to, because it's all perfect. This all happened for me to be where I am now today in this chair. And the other clarity came. And it was the knowing that none of that was here anymore. Everything was in my head. So it was the awareness of I am not this thought. I am not these experiences. I am not this noise. And I can decide right now what to do with all of this. So it was going back to that empty space. And then, oh, wow, at, at that office, I, oh, this is the other thing I experienced, Rick. It's when, and I read it later how, how they, they, they use the, the idea of forgiveness. But at that moment is when the true forgiveness happened, which is this knowing that there's nothing to forgive because nothing ever happened. Nothing ever happened to me. So imagine that state of freedom, right? That state of like liberation, calmness of the mind. And I love that office. Like if I'm walking in the clouds, I went into my car and I started to drive. And then I had a, that similar experience I had in the bus 19 years before happened in that car that day. I'm driving the car. And it was like... The presence of what we call source, the creator, God, was absolutely everything, Rick. There was nothing that was not it. The windshield, the car, the report, everything was that emanation of the presence. Everything was love. There's nothing that is not it. Wow, I had to stop the car and I'm like, this is who I am. There's nothing else. And then now it comes now after that, of course, after after that, wow, instead of clarity. And I knew oh, this is the other thing. At that moment, Rick, I knew that 20 years had passed from the time they told me in 20 years you will understand. Because the two questions I asked 20 years before were answered. And at that moment when I'm like, like not even 20 years had passed. And the questions were, how can, when did we stop? being one with the whole and how is it possible to forget? And the answer was one never stopped being one. One never left the source. And look at this, one just became distracted and seemingly forgot. We really never, we truly never forget. We, that's why we want to go back to it. That, what, that's is that, that sense of like, why you want to, why you want happiness? Because you want to go back to it. Why you want love? Because you want to go back to it. So we never really forget. We just get distracted. And that's what happened. Yeah. And I imagine that now, having gone through that whole 20 years, you know your, your questions are answered in a living way 
much better than any little communication could have taught you back then. You had to go through all this, and now it's really profound. It's in your bones. Yes, and you know, Rick, because this is the part also with the spirituality and with, when the confusion can happen, because it's not just to become a self-realized being, but how you integrate that into your life. Exactly. It's become yeah. a self-actualized being. What do I do with this? And then you have those is all different levels of awakening. You're the awakening or realizing I am awareness, but now what do I do with this? So is that what we would say the awakening is of, of, of the heart, the awakening of the next level? How do I share? How do I give? How do how I am that life for the world? And now how I ground this, <laughs> how I bring it to fruition, how I share it with others, like he's asking in his question, how I put my feet in the ground and bring this to the rest. Then you have to go to all this process because look, I, I was even arrogant when I was little. I would look at others, Rick, and I said, that people are stupid. They don't know anything because I didn't understand. Then I have to go through all the sufferings to understand compassion, to understand the kindness, to have the empathy, to go to that place of connection, the beings of light we're talking about. And then, oh, now I at that very profound level and all my levels of being, I understand. Yeah, you know, that that answers more thoroughly the question that I asked about an hour ago, which is, you know, why can't we just be born like enlightened little kids and stay that way? Why do we have to go through all this stuff? But you just explained it, you know, you, you have to go through all this stuff because then it becomes, you become an embodied, you know, fully embodied representative of higher consciousness. It's, it's not just... Um, you know, and you can deal with with all different levels of concern, all different levels of reality. You can't, you know, you, you don't have to just sort of, like you said, when you were a child, try to sleep all the time so you can just get inward and have that experience. You can do it totally in the waking state, totally engaged in raising the family and having a business and doing everything that, but you can maintain, you know, that, um, that what do you call it, being or higher consciousness or whatever word you want to use yes, I, in the midst of all that yes and actually like you say it's cool when i said why I, why do i want to wake up people saying like because it's awesome you become more intelligent you know what to do like with the guy in the beach i i knew how to handle at, at all levels of being even if you're just doing it at, at, at an energy level you can shock somebody with your eyes <laughs> that person will run away when i was working in, in all these projects even though i didn't have the connection i have now I always was connected, Rick, and I created incredible projects. I was never at the level of the problem. I was always, how do I solve this problem? And this is the other thing. The more awakened you become, the problems or, or the challenges are not don't become problems. They become opportunities. Yeah. So it doesn't mean that I don't have challenges. But when a challenge comes now, I'm like, bring it up. Because yeah, that, what do you I have know to that teach will, me? Exactly, I know. And of course, sometimes I have my head under the water. I'm not going to say that I don't cry, that I don't scream, but it's faster and easier. I even have a friend. She's amazing. The being so light said to me, learn to recognize the reset button, the, the, um, the triggers, but also have reset buttons. Create your spiritual environment. So the spiritual environment is, is the book, the friend, the place that you can go back to alignment. So I, I have this friend and I just call her and I'm like, whatever it is. And she's that. And she just later confessed to me, Ingrid, I just wait that we hang the phone and you call me like an hour later, whatever, a day later with the answer. So I'm, 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 I'm waiting because you're going to bring new teaching. You're going to bring new awakening. And that's what happened. If we see our challenges as opportunities, we keep evolving. We keep growing. We can just, and, and we can help others too to see their, their problem or, or their challenges as, as, as an opportunity to grow. <laughs> I remember when I started meditating, I was, um, I was living with this family and they had seven kids and a dog and a pet raccoon and all kind of rock band in the basement and all kinds of stuff. And uh, so I used to go out in the back and climb up in a tree and meditate in a tree house that they had built up there. And it was a nice, quiet place. I could get away from everything. So, so they, they made up this song about me um, based on Hey Jude by the Beatles. And it was, it was like, hey, dude, 
up in your tree, you know, get out of you and into me, you know. But, um, but the point was that by getting into oneself, by, by sort of dipping into pure awareness, one's true nature, one then has the resources to bring to bear on whatever you want to do in the outer world. Yes, and you know, recreate the real change. I'm going to give you this, this really cool teaching. One day my husband had this back pain. And I'm and I'm sitting in, in my studio there working and he comes, Oh, I'm going to get a massage because my back hurts. And he left. And at that moment the being so light said to me, He's not going to heal. And I'm like, What? And they said, No, because that's the that's already a result. He's not going to heal because that's not the cause. Uh-huh. That's that's the result already. There's a deeper cause. And exactly that he has to go to the level of of the cause exactly to change within so they said so they show me an equation and they said look one plus one is two you cannot change the number two you cannot change the result it's already a result you have to go within so the analogy was go go within and create a new equation when you go within now you you are and you are able to see things from a deeper place, now you can create a new result. Now, now one plus two is three. And they said, <laughs> and they laugh, and they say, look at how much energy and how much uh, people waste in trying to change results when they have to go to the cause. Mm. They have to go within. They have to resolve it from within. And what happened when you create a new reality? Yeah. I'll give you two analogies. You probably have heard these. Um, because you actually learned TM back in the old days. And we used to use this as a TM teacher. What One thing is, if you want to shoot an arrow, you can't just put it on the bow and let go because it'll just fall to the ground. You have to pull it back first. And then that prepares you to, you know, sh- prepares the arrow to really shoot forwards. Or another analogy is, you know, if you want to spend something in the marketplace, you, you need to go to the bank first and get some money. And then, you, then you'll be able to spend. Um, so we could think of uh, many other examples. But... Going within is preparation. I mean, it has its own intrinsic value, but it's preparation for whatever else you want to do. You know, Krishna said to Arjuna, Mm -hmm. transcend, and then he said, established in yoga, perform action, and then he said, yoga is skill in action. Yes, yes, that's right, Rick. That's why when the beings of light talk about the doing, the saying, that has to come from being is because that's the place where true creation happens. When we are in tune, when we are connected to the depthness of who we are, that's when we're acting and that's what we're saying come from the place of awareness, from the place of wisdom, from the place of clarity. The beings of light once said to me, Ingrid, you think that you are actually thinking and people are all the time thinking? And I said, yeah, of course, all the time. And they said to me, no, most of the time people are not truly thinking. They're not using the true gift of thinking. They're just remembering. We're trapped most of the time, 98% of the time in our own memories. The only way to be connected with the true creative thinking of the universe is by quieting the mind, by going within, by reconnecting with that center of beingness. And from there, the doing and the saying, wow, are very powerful. And then we also start receiving clear messages, even about knowing what to do. Now I am whenever, wherever, and I could be in the bathroom, it don't matter. And I can hear a message, I I hear the voice. The inner voice actually sent to me, a challenge is coming. <gasps> Imagine that, Rick, that gives me the time, that gives me 
the possibility to go back and center myself, go back to that place of balance, quiet in my mind and connect with my inner wisdom. And then from there, I can be ready for what is to come. So if I know just to give an example that a, a car accident is happened, I, I can buckle up and be ready for what is to come. That's one of the great perks of waking up is that you can use oh, that awareness, that wisdom, that connection to be that awakened being in action. And I would suggest that, you know, not everybody's going to hear beings of light giving them tips that things are coming, but we know life, you know, life, things come, things are going to happen. There's always going to be challenges. So time to prepare. Um, and in the, yes, and in this case, that's why I mentioned my, my inner voice, because there's different ways to receive communication. We all try to leave it in the outside. But it's not like that, Rick. We we have what is called inner wisdom. We have our inner voice. We have been, if we are eternal beings that have been experiencing so much, get, imagine the library of knowledge that we have within ourselves. Yeah. And the connection, of course, now we have with beings of light, the universe, whatever, what would they call Akashic records, mm -hmm. everything else. There's, everything is a library of knowledge. When we learn to quiet our mind, oh, we connect with... With all that wisdom. The home of all and, knowledge. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and we know what to do. It's yeah, amazing. Yeah. yeah, sometimes that that field of being is referred to in the ancient traditions as like the home of all knowledge. And, and you know, what that means is that even though you as an individual couldn't possibly know all the details about everything, you know, um, there's just no one individual possibly could, if you're if you're sort of dwelling and, and, and functioning from that level, then you get the benefit that would be had by knowing all the details, even without having to know all the details. Yes, yes. So, uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a much profound knowing. It's yeah, like, yeah. You know, you're, you're now actually become your, your own guide. <laughs> you have your own GPS on and you're guiding yourself. Yeah. So, so this is incredible. This is amazing. Yeah. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. <laughs> the 23rd Psalm. Beautiful description of, it, of what we're talking about. <clears throat> absolutely beautiful. Okay. Well, we better wrap it up. Um, thank you so much for this conversation. Um, during this conversation, we've been alluding to little points here and there in your book, but the whole book is very interesting, and um, <clears throat> you know, I would recommend that people read it if they're interested. Um, here's I'm just showing your website on the screen right now, Ingrid Hankel, a PhD, and uh, I'll have a page on batgap.com that has a link to your website and a link to your book and everything. Um, let me see what I can do here. I'll just scroll down the page. There you are. <laughs> There's a couple of videos, that very nice professional videos are, that were made. I'm showing pictures of your book now. It's been translated into Spanish also. Um, and then some testimonials from people and some videos from you. Very nice website. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Anyway, thanks, Ingrid. It's been great getting to know you. And um, I already knew you pretty well before we even started talking today because I've sort mm -hmm. of been in your world for the past week. But um, it's been a lot of fun. <laughs> Thanks so much, Rick. Yeah, there's there's a lot of fun, and I just if, if I can share one more thing before we leave, uh -huh. if that's okay. But sure. I just I just say to people, and and this is one of the the last teachings I receive is that remind people to go back to that place of gratitude. Yeah, gratitude is is that what we are. That's why it's the highest vibrational frequency there is. And the being so light lately said to me, Ingrid. If you don't imagine how grateful every human being would be if they realize that for you to exist, trillions and trillions and trillions of subatomic particles have to be in agreement. Yeah. 
They said, Ingrid, you are, you rig, Irene, all of us, you are a divine intention. Wow, Rick. So now when I see you, when I see anybody, when I see this pen, when I see a glass of water, I am like, wow, this is divine intention. Imagine that gratitude. This water exists for me to drink and a trillions of particles agree for me to make this water and me drink it. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful to see life as a divine play like that. Here's a quote from your book. You say, when you think that you are too much, remember that you are but a speck of dust in the vast universe. And when you feel like you are nothing, remember that you are as whole as the universe. And then you mentioned seeing entire communities of microorganisms in a single drop of seawater brought you to recognize the, the vastness of this universe. But um, it's beautiful to consider that in every little drop of water or every little anything that there is just a vast display of intelligence and that that intelligence just pervades the entire vast universe every cubic centimeter of it it's just full of of that full potential of of uh you know intelligence and organizing power and, yes you know we can merge with that existence itself mm -hmm. like, oh, life itself is like wow <laughs> so being in a state of gratitude wow then now now you can communicate with everything with, with all level, levels of being with, with yourself yeah so you mentioned during our talk that you do one-on-one -on -one conversations with people is what else do you do uh, how can people connect with you or get involved in any way yeah, that's good. I, I, I do that, the one-on-ones, and I, I'm also creating a community mm -hmm. because people are, are asking me, especially all the people I do sessions with, they're like, how can we keep in touch with you? Because, I, of course, trying to answer emails for every person is, is impossible. So now I'm creating a community where I'm planning to do like two meetings a month and answer questions and interact that way great so that that is in the process of, of being and i also do a speaking engagements and workshops so all that i'm available oh, you, you <laughs> used to do speaking engagements before we all had to go underground <laughs> to the I know. Yeah. now they are all in zoom right, right. <laughs> all right yes. well thanks so much ingrid and uh you know, I've really enjoyed spending time with you, and thanks to those who've been listening or watching. Um, <clears throat> next week, I'll be totally shifting gears and, and speaking with three guys who run the Conspirituality Podcast, which is about the strange infiltration of conspiracy theory thinking and QAnon and stuff like that into spiritual communities, which has been really quite widespread and deep. Um, so we're going to talk about that subject, which is one of my bizarre fascinations <laughs> anyway um thanks a lot ingrid and thanks to those who've been watching and we'll see you for the next one thanks so much rick talk to you later talk to you later